Hi there, my name is Raphael Weinstein. I'm an engineer. I work on WebKit for the Chromium team, and I'd like to talk to you about uh, Object Observe. Um, so Object Observe is a proposed mechanism for JavaScript. Um, it's currently being considered by TC39, which is the JavaScript standards body. Um, and uh, the feeling of the standards body is that it's on the right track, but they want feedback from the development community. And as such, we've implemented uh, an experimental version of this in a branch of V8, and it's available um, in binaries of Chromium. Uh, there's Windows and Mac binaries available, and there's build instructions for Linux, um, and we like people to try it out and give us feedback. So let's talk a bit about uh, why we want to do this. So what are we observing this time? Um, so what we're just observing is changes to JavaScript data objects. We want to know when properties get added, changed, deleted, um, when arrays have uh, elements spliced in and out of them, so on and so forth. Um, the, one of the main reasons to care about this is model view control separation. Um, this is getting more and more popular with good reason. Um, it saves you a lot of time of writing really repetitive code which just shuttles data to and from the DOM uh, between uh, your application internal state in the heap or in the server. Um, it's code that's uh, really uh, pretty repetitive and um, kind of error prone and you'd like to just be able to declare the relationship between your data and the DOM and have the DOM stay up to date here we're looking at an Angular snippet, uh, which does this, um, and Angular just wants to know when this array of phones changed. Um, <clears throat> a couple other examples, you could imagine a persistence mechanism saving uh, the state of data directly to something like IndexedDB, or you could imagine a constraint-based system, which is essentially um, in enforcing relationships between data properties or forms values based on equations, based on relationships between data and observing when that data changes. Um, so with those examples in mind, let's take a look at the examples. Um, so first, here's the base case. Here's MDV, which is similar to Angular or Ember. It's an MVC mechanism, um, and uh, it binds uh, data to the DOM. Here we have our people array, and I can push a person into my people array. And as you'll see, it's there, but nothing much interesting is happening in the DOM, and it's because I need to tell the DOM to go do something called dirty checking. Um, and when I tell it that, it discovers that Bill has showed up, um, but uh, it needed to go check all the potential uh, places where data could have changed, and, um, and it needed to be told. Um, frameworks which use this approach um, are pretty clever about being able to do this um, whenever data could have changed, but it's not perfect, um, and there's some other problems. Um, so let's look at uh, what we'd like to see, which is uh, the same example using a version of MDV which has been implemented to use this object observe mechanism. So again, uh, let's uh, add uh, Bill onto our people array here. And we see he shows up right away. Um, and basically, anyway, I mutate this data, uh, the DOM is going to follow with me. So uh, I don't know. Change the name to Sammy. Um, so the idea here is just to pinpoint when data changes and uh, react to exactly what's changed, when it's changed. Um, Another example is this persistence mechanism I mentioned. Um, this is a very, very naive uh, sort of just hack I created today, um, but I think it illustrates the point. Uh, I'll create a class which doesn't do much called foo. I'll ask my persistDB to retrieve me um, my parallel array of foo. Um, whoops. I wanted to save that in records. Um, so now I have this records um, array which represents um, a serialized version of uh, a collection of these foos. So I'm going to push onto it um, a new foo. And you'll see that the serialization mechanism just saved it automatically to disk. I can go add data to that record. I can do really whatever I want to it. Um, and it's just going to save it out and then next time I come back and load it up. Lo and behold, that uh, data is there for me in my record. So basically, automatically, when I change my data, it gets serialized to index DB, and I can pull it back out again. So that's kind of nice. Um, the last one is the constraint mechanism. 
what I have here is a circle. Here's a circle class, and I'm using, I'm loaded my constraint library. And basically what I'm saying is that there are three properties on my circle, radius, circumference, and area, and they're related in a familiar way. You should recognize these equations, and the constraint mechanism basically just represents these with um, methods which resolve data moving in one direction or another. Um, so I can create a circle and give it a radius of 4 and it's going to resolve uh, radius to assign to circumference and area. If I update area, it's going to resolve by assigning to radius and circumference. So this is pretty handy, um, and it actually happens to be one way of doing what a lot of people care about in MVC frameworks, which is called computed properties, where you want to have one property depend be dependent on the value of other properties. In this case, all the properties are interdependent, and it's resolved depending on which property you assign to. Um, but the idea is that the circle is internally observing itself and setting uh, dependent properties. Um, so this is another uh, uh, observation mechanism. And we can actually put all these three together. Um, here I have an app. It's an MVC app. It's using persistence. It's using uh, the constraint solver. I can create a new circle. You'll see down at the bottom it saved that for me right away. Uh, I can set a radius. The radius assigns to area and circumference. I can update any of these values and it'll update the other values. Everything is automatically saved. Um, if I uh, refresh, I get these values back, so on and so forth. I can delete. Um, and uh, one of the things to notice is because of the timing of the way that object observe works, um, you have a lot of power uh, to control uh, when things happen. Um, and to illustrate this, um, I am going to, there's my circle array, I'm going to um, modify each of these circles. I'll increase the radius uh, by power of 2. Um, and what you see here is essentially the um, resolver updated the internal properties of each of these circles first. And then second, the persistence mechanism went and saw that two circles have changed and serialized them to disk as a single transaction. Um, and because of the way that, uh, that the ordering of delivery happens, it turns out you have a lot of control over when things um, need to happen and as a consequence um, can kind of get some really nice behavior of treating uh, lots of changes as a transaction, um, this is a very consistent view of the world, um, and it's pretty desirable. Um, so let's dive back in and talk a little bit more about uh, what um, the existing approaches to this uh, are right now. So basically there's two approaches. There's container objects and there's dirty checking. Um, container objects is kind of what it sounds like. Um, a framework generally creates these objects which sort of on the inside hold the data, and then they have kind of accessors to the data, and they capture when you set or get and internally they broadcast. Um, this works well, it's relatively performant. The problem is, is now you're using this kind of different kind of object. Um, and generally speaking, you have to convert from data you get from the server into these objects so that they're observable. Um, and it doesn't compose especially well with existing JavaScript code because most code tends to assume that it can operate on raw JavaScript data, not on these specialized objects. <clears throat> so dirty checking is the other approach we saw it a second ago. Um, the basic idea is that um, anytime data could have changed, I go check and see if it did change. So the benefit here is that I get to use raw JavaScript data, but downside is, is it's potentially very expensive because it means I might do a lot of dirty checking. Um, <clears throat> it's also kind of hard to dirty check exactly when you need to. Um, there's lots of clever tricks that frameworks use for this, but um, it's unclear to me that they're ever going to be, be able to be perfect. Um, so what we'd like is the ability to kind of have the best of both worlds. We want to be able to use raw data objects if we choose to, and we don't want to have to dirty check everything all the time. So that's where object observe comes in. Basically, this allows you to uh, observe changes to any given object. You can find out when properties have been added, uh, when they've been deleted, when any given property has been reconfigured, say from a data property to an accessor. Um, or you can find out to ch find out about changes to the value of data properties, not accessors. Um, I'll come back to this in a second. So notification is very similar to the mutation observers. It happens at the end of microtask. In the browser context, this is almost always going to be at the end of the current event handler. Um, this timing is nice because generally a 
uh, one sort of unit of work has just been finished and now observers get to go do their units of work. It's sort of a nice um, turn-based uh, processing model. Um, it is the same time timing as domitation observers. Um, <clears throat> and I know that there's a robust debate right now uh, about synchronous versus asynchronous notification. Um, and it's it's been my experience, it's my conclusion, and it's been the experience of a lot of other people um, that have worked in on the web platform that synchronous is kind of the first thing you try. It, it's actually the easiest thing to think about. It's the easiest thing to wrap your head around. Um, the problem is it creates this fundamentally dangerous processing model. Um, and the danger is, is kind of two manifestations. Um, one is that if you're writing code um, and you say update uh, the property of an object, um, you really don't want the situation where having updating the property of the object could have invited arbitrary code to do go do whatever it wanted to. Um, you don't want to have your assumptions being invalidated, you know, as you're running through the middle of a function. Um, the flip side of that is if you're an observer, ideally you really don't want to be called when someone's in the middle of doing something. You'd like not to be asked to go do work on sort of an inconsistent state of the world. Um, you have to do a lot more error checking. You have to tolerate a lot more um, sort of bad situations. Um, and generally, this is just a really, really hard model to work with. Um, it's why the DOM uh, mutation events are deprecated, and it's why, generally speaking, the web platform is trying to add fewer synchronous uh, events. Um, asynchronous are harder to deal with, but ultimately, they're more uh, sound. It's, it's a more sound programming model. So uh, let's talk about accessors and computed properties because I mentioned before that only um, the uh, value changes are observable for data properties, not uh, computed properties or accessors. Um, so the reason is, you can sort of see this here, that um, JavaScript really doesn't have any notion of changes in value to accessors. An accessor just is a collection of functions. If you assign to an accessor, JavaScript happily just invokes the function there, and from its point of view, nothing has changed. It just gave some code the opportunity to run. Now, the problem is, semantically here, we can look at this assignment to the value. Um, we assign 5 to it, and we think, well, we ought to be able to know what happened here. Um, the problem is, is this is an unsolvable problem, uh, and this example de demonstrates why. Um, there's really no way uh, for any system to, to know what this meant. Because um, because this can be arbitrary code, it can do whatever it wants. In this case, um, it is updating a value every time it's accessed. So asking when does it change doesn't really have any meaning. So the solution to this is synthetic change records. Basically, um, if you want to have accessors or computer properties, it's your responsibility to notify when these values change. This is some extra work, but it is designed as a, sort of a first class feature of this mechanism. And these notifications will be delivered with the, the rest of the notifications that come from, uh, from underlying data objects, from data properties. So the idea here is we have this uh, circle, there's a radius property, and in this case, um, radius is an accessor, and when its value changes, um, it is actually going to notify for itself the value changed, um, and this will be delivered with all other changes to this object or any other object. So if essentially, if you are implementing an object, you want to have um, synthetic or computer properties, um, you'll need to pick a strategy for how this is going to work, but once you do, it'll um, fit into the system as a whole. So lastly, we provided um, sort of a utility library called the change summary, which is similar to the mutation summary. It's in the same spirit. Um, I expect this to change more over time as we find out what people need from it. Um, it offers um, an aggregate view of the world. It sort of sums up changes uh, and delivers them kind of a report of what's changed. Um, you can see here what it tells you. Um, the two things to, to know about this, which I think are powerful, are one, that you can observe uh, paths. So you can say, I want to observe foo.bar.bath.baz from a given object, and it'll tell you when the value at that path changed. Um, if the path is unre ever unreachable, it considers the value to be un undefined. Um, the second powerful thing it does here is it'll tell you about array splices. And array splices are basically um, the minimal set of splice operations you would have to perform on an array in order to transform the old version of the array into the new version of the array. Um, this is sort of a trans uh, a transform or a different view of um, basically the edit distance of an array. Um, it's the minimum amount of work you need to do to the array to move it from the old state to the new state. Um, and it's generally what you want to know. Um, so 
give it a try, dive in, give us feedback. Um, again, this is available uh, from GitHub. There's two projects, Raphael W slash V8, Raphael W slash change summary. The binaries are linked to from there. Try it out, submit feedback to ES Discuss, that's also linked, um, and uh, help us make this uh, a successful feature. Thanks so much.